Welcome to another incredible episode of America This Week. 2020 has been a year for the record books, and it's barely halfway over. A global pandemic that created a whirlwind economy, a massive movement to end racial injustice, and to top it all off, it's a big election year. We've covered it on this show with guests you'll only see right here and conversations you won't hear anywhere else on topics you'll never see the mainstream media covering. The mean streets in America are getting meaner and meaner, and somehow the calls for defunding the police are getting louder and louder. It begs the question, are you sure you really want to do this? This past weekend on America's 244th birthday, violence spread across the country faster and deadlier than any Chinese virus could. In Chicago, my hometown, 87 people shot, 17 shot dead. Sadly, Chicago is on pace for our deadliest year in history. Meanwhile, Chicago is in the process of defunding the cops to the tune of several hundred million dollars. To New York, where bullets rained out, 64 people shot, 10 shot dead. New York is voting to cut a billion dollars from the NYPD. In LA, they're cutting $150 million from cops' budgets. Anyone surprised that in the first week of June, homicides spiked 250%? Or Philadelphia? where shootings are up 67% while the Philly police budget was cut by $19 million. How about Baltimore? Ah, Baltimore. USA Today ranked Baltimore number three in the most dangerous cities in America, just behind St. Louis and Detroit. Last year, Baltimore broke a record with 348 homicides. Baltimore is now on pace to smash that record this year. And you guessed it, Balto just slashed $22 million from their police budget. Now take a look at this video from New York City this week. Warning, this is a graphic video and may be disturbing. This guy was walking with his little baby girl, the man assassinated in broad daylight. Watch how the little girl is almost child victim number seven. I'll explain that number seven in a moment. More than 200 Americans shot dead across the country last week. This doesn't look like America, folks. Our country has become unrecognizable. It's gotta stop. You liberal mayors need to step up and stop catering to the anti-American criminal mobs shooting up our streets. Do you really not see the direct correlation between defunding the police and the escalating violence? Do you even care about the welfare of your citizens or is it just about your re-election prospects? Do black lives matter or do black votes matter? I submit you care more about the latter over the former. Finally, Check out this heartbreaking graphic of four of the six little children caught in the crossfire of gun violence in America last weekend alone. Sequoia Turner was just eight, shot as her mom turned into a parking lot in Atlanta, not far from the Wendy's where Rashard Brooks was killed. Royta DeMarco Giles was eight. He just finished second grade in Alabama. Devon McNeil, 11 years old, Washington, D.C., was shot when he ran into his grandmom's house for a phone charger. Natalia Wallace, Chicago, was seven, shot in the head while playing with her cousins in her own backyard. Babies shot dead, not one, six of them, just this past weekend, and nearly a seventh. All the cities I mentioned in this memo are run by very liberal mayors. They're all calling for their police departments to be defunded in some form or another. All are of the most difficult places in America to legally own and carry a firearm for your own protection. Since I'm a common sense guy, I suggest you see the obvious correlation between liberal mayors and violent cities. And if you don't see a direct correlation, well, you're just not trying very hard. It begs the question, with America devolving into an abyss of violence, murder, and mayhem, why would anyone vote for more democratic policies like this guy? By the way, isn't that the guy who said of desegregating and busing black kids with white kids? And I'm quoting now, folks, unless we do something, my children are going to grow up in a jungle, that jungle being a racial jungle. Wow. Not sure, but isn't that racist? Or does old man Biden get a pass simply because he's one of those liberal Democrats? Where's the cancel crowd now? Seattle's autonomous zone called CHOP, which stands for Capitol Hill Organized Protest, was a failure. Last week, police finally cleared it out. but. The devastating impacts there will be felt forever by some. 
Joining me now is Horace Lorenzo Anderson Sr., whose son, 19-year-old Horace Lorenzo Anderson Jr., was shot and killed inside CHOP on June 20th. And Andre Taylor, their family spokesman. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me, Horace. We are so sorry for your family's loss, your loss. And Andre, we know you had a brother who was shot and killed by police in 2016. Our condolences to, to you as well, Andre. Horace, I got to start Thank with you. you from one grieving father to another. I lost a 19-year-old son. Um, there's no getting over it. I understand that. Tell us, tell us about Ren Lil Renz, as you call him. Tell us about him. Lil Renz, premature, 25 weeks. Strong, you know, you gotta think he was, this guy was a little guy when he was born. You know, he, you know, he was only one pound, eight ounces, seven ounces. Um, Man, he stayed in the hospital, you know, for about, man, five months. He was born at five months period, 25 weeks. Every day I was at that hospital going to see him in that incubator every day. I used to go up there, and he'd look at me, and the doctor would say, he can't see it. I said, man, he knows me. He's looking at me. I just knew the connection was there. It's just, you know, you can just feel it like this is my son, you know, and he was born, and that was just... It was just a blessing, you know, just to have him around me. I've been having custody of him since two years old, full custody. He's been with me and my, my other kids. You know, I got, you know, some other kids. I got um, um, my little niece now. I've, I've been having custody of now for like a year. You know, she's with us now. You know, she's one years old, you know. So, I don't know, God, been, I guess he blessed me and to, to at least be around my kids, be able to tell them I love them and give them a kiss and... Man, I had him in football. He played football. You know, he wasn't the best, you know, because, you know, he got, you know, he was a little, he had developmental delays and stuff like that, but he was a fighter. He, he going to try, you know, whatever. Dad, I can do it, you know, even though he couldn't do it, you know, but that was my little guy, man. And, and, and this chop thing, I don't, you know, I'm not a politician or whatever's going on, but somebody should have helped him. There was something, man. There, were, there could have been something. I know it's something that they could have did to try to help him because, Man, he just needed help, and I couldn't help him. You know, I was at home, you know, so I couldn't help him. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. and I haven't heard nothing. I mean, it's still, there's not, nobody, you know, it's like every day is a new day. Like this day, like, it's like I done did this day yesterday, or, you know, I don't remember yesterday. You know, it's everything, all my days are mixed up. I don't even know what today is. I think it's Tuesday or Wednesday or something, somewhere in there. But the days are getting mixed up. It's getting to where it's like, Man, I just need, I need something so I can go to sleep at night to lay down to, right. to you know. I mean, you well, gotta, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a father. I'm, you know, you got to think, I'm the father, not the mother. Yeah. I've been having my son, and and God bless me with him to take care of him. He's been with me, so yeah. we had a strong. That's strong for me. You know what I'm saying? As a black father, to have a son, you know. Yeah, sure. So, 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 so Lorenzo, you know, let me let me ask you this. That, Allow you know? me to ask you this, and 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 I'm and I agree with you. It, it doesn't. By the way, I, I hate to inform you. It's just you wake up every day. It, it's I'm two and a half years out. It's it's like every day. But let let, let me ask you this. You know. And I hear the story, and I've had Raz Simone on this show, who was the security or one of the leaders of CHOP, and, and he had a real problem with, with the access. In other words, there was first responders that wouldn't go in when, when, when Lil Renz was shot, but they didn't want cops in there. They didn't want outsiders in there. Who, who do you hold accountable besides the person who pulled the trigger, I mean, but who else? The police. There should have been police protection. That, that's what they're supposed to do. There should have been mobile units around there. There should have been. There should have already. If that chop was the way. When I went up there, I went up there after my son was killed. Man, they had barbecue grills. They had, man, they had cement blocks. They had things up there that were. I mean, how did it get there? You know, you're looking at they're selling hot dogs. You know, they took over the whole police precinct. They were sitting in front of the precinct, the police precinct. I mean, there still should have been mobile units around there, um, around like, you know, as if it was, I mean, that was like a more of a riot now. You know, took over the police precinct. That's mm -hmm. not protesting. That's a riot now. So that's not Black Lives Matter no more. That doesn't have to do with anything now. That should, they should have been shut that down. They should have sent the National Guards there a long time ago. So, but even if they didn't, 
there should have been police presence walking through there at all times, you know? So, so Andre, let me, let, me, let me ask you, Andre. I'm, I'm watching there. and Listen, I, I saw the video of Seattle police trying to get in there. They were, they were unequivocal. They were stopped by child people at the gate, and they couldn't go in. Now, in, in, Andre, what about Mayor Jenny Durkin? It, the mayor is the one who told the police to get out of CHOP, to clear out of town, let CHOP, let the CHOP have their moment, let them protest or do their way. I think she called it the summer of love and a block party. Obviously, was not, wasn't that right. Does, does no one hold her accountable for this? I've said on this show, I think she's got blood on her hands. I believe she has Renzo's blood on her hands. I think she has a 16-year-old's blood on her hands who also died after Lorenzo did because there's another shooting inside CHOP. But the mayor never told the police to go in and clean that place up. Can I get both of you? Andre, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of blame to go around in many places. We can place that blame in many places, right? But let me give you the backstory a little bit so we can clarify what everybody is understanding here. First of all, George Floyd was murdered. It was probably the most savage murder on camera, live, that I've ever seen in my life. This sparked this process where there were protests in all 50 states, right? There was a transitional period after that that brought us together, all of us together, right? And we're not, I'm not making any excuses for anything. And what I try to do is put myself in people's shoes. This was a situation that our country have never seen before. As far as a protest, as far as black, white, brown, purple, green, whatever, coming together and agreeing that this incident that happened here was wrong. Okay, now let's place that where it is. The other part is, I think that I myself would have had some type of trepidation on just going in there the first week or so and shutting the place down when there wasn't any violence, right? Because you don't want to be the guy or the woman that that is known for the for or, or for shutting down communities of colors, voices, young people that are trying to engage themselves in a process of change. Right. You don't want to be that prop. You don't want to be that person. I wouldn't want to be that person. So you're dealing with a situation that's highly sensitive that we've never faced before. And I think it was smart on whoever the leadership was to be careful. Now, my issue is when the violence started. That's when I involved myself and my organization. The moment the violence started, everything shifted. Whatever CHOP was designed to do at that time, there was a shift. So, so can that I happen? So I may ask, never get back. Let me ask sure. Ren, L sure. Lorenzo. So God bless you. You lost your son. But after you lost your son, it was time for the police to get in there, and the police needed to hear from that mayor, Mayor Dirk, and don't... Isn't this a failure on the mayors and the, and, and the other mayors in, or, across the country who are allowing these things to happen? Uh, uh, forget up until the violence, but certainly after the violence. They gotta, they gotta stop, right? It's, it's time to take the streets back to law and order, yes? About a half a minute or so. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I believe that. Um, they should have been stopped that way. After him, Man, I just, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not political, so I don't know who to go to or who mm -hmm. is Who's responsible or who was the main person that could have shut it down. I don't know if the police department, you know, I don't know who. I don't know who, who. But I know that it should have got shut down a long time ago. When they took, I don't know how you, man, explain right. to me how you take over a police department. I went up there and we were trying to, you know, just talk about my son and they were, trying to kick us they, they're trying to kick us out of chop saying we can't talk right now we can't do this and i'm going like i'm looking like you guys are disrespecting me my son i'm the the father of the 19 year old that just yeah. you know they were just so disrespectful so i'm i'm in my mind i'm going like with that so much disrespect we're i mean the police don't have control now yeah. i mean i don't I, understand honestly they, guys i mean so you so who do i go to now I'm, I, who do i go to now if i can't go to the police i i don't know horace i don't I don't know, and none of us know, and, and, and we're kind of learning as we go, and, and unfortunately, you know, the fallout is are, are things like your son dying and a 16-year-old dying nine days after your son died. But I do know one thing. Um, we got to stop with not going into these areas or stop 
trying not to offend people when people are dying, when children are dying. We, last weekend alone in Chicago, around the country, six babies under the age of 10, under the age of 11, were killed across America with violence, guys. I got to leave it there. Horace, Horace uh, Lorenzo Anderson Sr., God bless your son. God bless your family. Andre Taylor, thank you for your time, gentlemen. Um, we'll have you back. We'll have you back to talk about this some more. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate thank you, guys. We're always pleased to have Congressman Devin Nunes with us. Welcome back. Thanks for being here again, Congressman. This week has not been a good one for China. Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, says the U.S. is looking possibly to ban Chinese social media apps like TikTok. And let's not forget this week we find out that China may have uh, a little bit of bubonic plague showing up. But let me start on the tech stuff, especially with a California congressman. Obviously, Silicon Valley, Northern California, very important. Tech is very important to, to uh to to your neck of the woods tell us what's going on with china and their and their TikTok uh, specifically well there's an interesting ir irony here eric in talking about TikTok. Uh, the concern is is that it's controlled by the chinese communist party and they have the ability their intelligence service have the ability to go in there and get that data and they're also controlling the content now how does that relate to facebook google and twitter they're doing exactly the same thing. It's just that they're doing it on behalf of the Democratic Party. The people that run those corporations are left-wing ideologues or the corporate boardrooms are afraid of the left-wing ideologues. So the way that it works is that the propaganda, the media, and I'm not trying to offend you or your show because I know you try to do a good job in getting the facts out there, uh, but what you do is you take the propaganda they run it and eventually it reaches the corporate boardrooms because it, it, it runs through all the media. The corporate boardrooms and the, the extremists that work at Google, that work at Facebook, that work at Twitter, they end up controlling all of that content and intravenously feeding it to the American people. That's exactly the same concern that the State Department has with TikTok, that exactly the same thing's happening. So you have Chinese Communist Party propaganda making its way into the American people. I find the irony uh, quite, uh, you know, I think this is a good lesson, though, for the American people. They need to understand that TikTok's bad, but so are these other companies. You know, Congress, what about those who say um, free speech is protected under the First Amendment? Anyone can say what they want. Tell, tell us, I think there's a little bit of a, 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 a difference uh, with distinction here, whereas free speech is important. You should be able to say what you want to say. But then again, you're, you're yeah. suggesting that some of these companies, these social media companies, are regulating how much of different types of speech we're allowed to, to consume as a consumer of these social media platforms. Yeah, I think that that's a red herring argument. And in fact, it's these social media companies that are including TikTok from China, including Facebook, Google, and Twitter, they're actually taking away our First Amendment right. So when, when the internet and the World Wide Web was first created, it was supposed to be an intersection where everybody met. And the only thing these tech companies were supposed to do is they were supposed to ensure the safety of these intersections so that everyone had access to these intersections. What's happening now is quite the opposite. Because they're tech, tech oligarchs is what I like to call them, they're monopolies, they control the entrance to the public square. And you have to remember, the U.S. taxpayers are the ones that actually helped to develop the World Wide Web. And then we gave these companies powers to ensure that they were going to make sure that everybody could go on there and, and put their content. So it's actually the opposite, Eric. They're actually, they've taken away our First Amendment rights. They're not protecting it in any way, shape, or form. So, so there's an interesting little sub-development, subplot developing with social media platforms, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and, and others. Some are trying to hold these companies accountable, Zuckerberg and Facebook, for, for some of the comments that are being made. Now, this, for me, very, ventures into an area of very dangerous uh, area where government is going to now talk about or regulate what comments are allowed to be posted on some of, of these platforms. I mean, we, we do give right. Facebook, Twitter, even Parler the rights to decide what they're allowed to post on there. So their private companies are allowed to do that. But when is government extending its hand too far into private business? Well, look, when, whenever you become a monopoly, that's the concern here is these companies are monopolies. I'm glad that you brought up Parler. So I'm using Parler pretty much exclusively now. I still have to go onto Instagram and Facebook and Twitter every once in a while to put something out just so I can reach the people that are not on Parler. But what Parler's doing, I think, is, is what should be done. 
And what they're using is they're using the long established rule of law based on the FCC and other guidelines. So, so in other words, I think a good rule of thumb is that if you can say whatever I can say on your show here, okay, because you're, you know, you have kind of basic regulations, right? Like I can't come onto your show or, or let's use the old classic one, run into a movie theater and say, fire, 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 everybody get out. And then people get trampled, people get injured, people get killed. That's not free speech. So I think the way that you're regulated uh, at, at, at Sinclair and your show's regulated, that's essentially kind of a good rule of thumb of how these the intersections should be regulated. So for example, you should not be able to go on there and put pornography, especially child pornography, things that are against the law. Those are the things that should not be allowed on there. You can't just go on and just, uh, and, and just defame people. You know, defamation, slander, libel, those sorts of things uh, you know, should not be tolerated. Now, now where they should be, and this is the problem with, with Twitter, Facebook, and Google, is you know, they're essentially suppressing. When someone goes on there and says, oh, well, look, I don't agree uh, that you should be able to tear down statues. I don't agree. I think BLM is an extremist group, and I think they're tearing down statues of Fred, Frederick Douglass, who was, a, you know, who was a really a hero of the African-American community. I think that's wrong. What Google, Facebook, and Twitter are doing is they're saying, oh, wait, you can't attack Black Lives Matter. You're a racist. You have to, you have to pull that down. So that's where, yeah. that's the problem. That's yeah. where they're intersecting. And that's, uh, well, and well, that's they're, really they're, the difference. You know where they're Parler's intersecting? Take off, Congressman, the they're intersecting at editorializing. And, and, and typically they've, they've kind of shielded themselves from, from scrutiny and regulation by saying, we're not going to editorialize. We're not going to be a news service by editorializing. Therefore, leave us alone. And we've generally left them alone. And now by omission and by selection, that's exactly what they're doing. They're editorializing. We'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm on par Parler as well. I know John Mates, the CEO of Parler, was there from day one. He's been on this show more than a year ago. We'll see. It's a tall order. We'll see if he can continue to be as, I guess, fair-handed as he's been up until this point. Congressman Nunes, appreciate your time as always. Now, here are a couple names you'll recognize for sure. They're on the advisory board of Donald J. Trump for president. They're also internet sensations and video bloggers, also known as vloggers. Lynette Diamond Hardaway and Rochelle Silk Richardson, a.k.a. Diamond and Silk. Everybody, thank you for being here. Also, good friends of mine for a very long time. Diamond and Silk. Kanye wants to be president. Yay wants to be Prezi. What do you say? Nay. Nay. <laughs> We're voting for Donald J. Trump. That's right. So what, what's, this all, what, what's this all about? What, you know, I, I, thought they were, I thought they were buds. I thought Kanye came to the White House. They were friends. Now... Now, Kanye says, no, forget that. I want your job, Mr. President. Well, here's the deal. Let me tell you something. Right now, we don't have time for, for games. We don't have time for people that's trying to push their own agenda that's when right. they're pr probably trying to sell another record or album. Right now, we're in the fight of our lives, and everybody should stand up and make sure that you pump your fist for Donald J. Trump and you go vote for Donald J. Trump. And you have to understand, even Jesus had a Judas. That's it right. comes in every bunch. Understand that. Yes. But we're gonna keep this train a moving. No, well, so, so what about that? What about the um, those of them or us who would say that if if Kanye wants to be president, he's gonna he's gonna split the Democrat vote, and Donald Trump walks right into office. You got to kind of like that idea, don't you? Well, the deal is you have to understand that we already have a president who's doing his very, very best for we the American people. We understand what Kanye West, he's having a dream that this is something he wants to do, but he need to wait for like what, 2024 and try that? Right now it's about Donald J. Trump and getting our man elected for this economy. This is a serious issue right here. And when I look at uh, uh, Kanye West, he's having his own mm -hmm moment. So we're gonna keep him there with that moment. But right now it's about getting our president elected. And, but uh, now, if he want to jump on that, wait a minute, Eric. If he want to jump on the Democrat ticket and yeah. quit Biden, so he can. But yeah. don't play those games on the Republican side. We're going to win. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I doubt he's going to run as Republican. I, I can't imagine he get any votes as Republican. By the way, Yeezy, the brand Yeezy, his 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 sneaker brand and, and other got some PPP. I'm not sure that the billionaire Kanye needed PPP money. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about Black Lives Matter, if you guys don't mind. Yeah. Um, there, there's there's so much going on. There's so, I did a monologue about this earlier in the show, talking about with the Democrats, they, is it 
Black Lives Matter or Black Votes Matter? Let's start with you, Diamond. What, what's going on in the left? Well, I believe that the left believe that Black Votes Matter and anybody's Black body will do to That's get right. a vote. Yeah. You have to understand that when they talk about Black Lives Matter, what are you pumping your fist to? You're pumping your fist to an organization who spread propaganda, mm -hmm. who's who's the, the, the owners of those of that particular organization call themselves Marxists, which they're trying to push communism and they want to tear down, disrupt the nuclear family. Yeah. And what I won't understand if white lives, to, to my white brothers and sisters, if black lives really cared, if white lives really cared about black lives, uh -huh. then why are you all pumping money into this organization that wants to tear down the black family? That's right. Black people, black lives deserve families. Black children deserve a mother and a father. Yeah. And I think a lot of the stuff that you see out in the streets with them pumping their fists and tearing down the stature and erasing history, a lot of that is because of the lack of parenting. That's there right. is not a two parent home. You know, that's at what 20 some percent now when that used to be at 70 percent. So we need to take a whole look at what are we pumping our fists to? Listen, yeah. I want all lives to matter. So, all so, so, so talk to me a little bit about uh, about Colin Kaepernick. A lot of this is is based on some of the things that Colin Kaepernick has been talking about for a couple of years now. Do you think um, you think he was wrong, Kaepernick? I don't think Most he's of, yeah, I don't well, Go ahead, Sid. Well, I, I don't think he should have been kneeling on a flag. That's Go ahead. right. You know, the deal is that we need to chastisement starts at home. Right. Okay. We got to take care of our own home. There's a lot of black on black crime that's going on, and you teach people how to treat you. I understand that he want to kneel on the flag, but it's because of that flag that he's even a millionaire today. Right now, all of these different organizations and groups. I look at them as domestic terrorist organizations because they are terrorizing the American people. Right now, it's about, let's see how we can all be prosperous and be able to obtain the American dream. And taking a black face off of the syrup bottle, getting rid of uh, all of these statues is not going to stop racism. When I look at the Democrat Party today, they are the party of slavery, racism, Jim Crow, and segregation, and systemic racism. If you want to dismantle racism, then just dismantle the Democrat Party. When I see Colin Kaepernick and a lot of these other people out there, upset about everything that's going on in our country you're voting for the same people the same party that put those systems in place so if you continue to do the same thing you're going to continue to get the same result so fault yourself start with the man in the mirror and change your own heart all right diamond right. let's let's talk a little bit about uh, president trump at mount rushmore last week and, and you know a lot of people we have took issue with it because there were some of the four faces that were on Mount Rushmore. There may have been a couple that had slave, o they were slave owners in the past. Talk to us, um, what's the messaging here? What's the proper takeaway from African American and, and conservative African Americans with President Trump at Mount Rushmore? I thought that the message was unity. Yes. Let's bring our country together and let's not destroy our country or destroy history because if we do that, we're doomed to repeat it. But what I find ironic with the left and those that take issue with the speeches, you out here and you're pumping your fists in the streets. You want to tear down all of the slave owners' statues. Uh -huh. But those slave owners were in the Democrat Party. Right. They were the one that fought in the Civil War to keep slavery going. Right. But you want to vote for that same system, the same Democrat Party. Yeah. You mad at the statues. Them statues didn't do nothing to you. They can't feed you. They can't clothe you. They can't give you a job. That's right. So stop looking at the statues. It's not the statues. When we talk about systemic racism, just like Stoke said, that's these white left-leaning liberals that put them in place. That's Let's right. start there. All right, very quickly, Silk, so very quickly, that final call, about 20 seconds or so. How in the heck did you guys get Diamond and Silk? Where'd that name come from? Wow, that was something we understood what was going on at the, in a political spectrum. It was a dangerous time at that time. And using our government name, it was very dangerous for us. So we came up with these names right here. We just didn't know it was going to be a household brand name. And so it, it, it is what it is. You have to ask God about, about all of that. If you ever want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. We had no plans for this, but we thank God for this opportunity and for trusting that Diamond and Silk knew exactly what to do. Go and ahead. get our book that's coming out August 2020, diamondandsilkbook.com. There you go. There it is. And you have a, a tour dates and, you know, chit-chat tour 2020. Diamond and Silk, all about it. I think I'm going to go with 
Uh, I'm going to go with gold. How about instead of Eric Boeing, I'm just going with gold. Is that all right? Can we do that? I love it. All right, you yes. too. Diamond and Silk, thank you guys very much. See you soon. Wow. Straight ahead on America This Week, we're taking a closer look at the cancel culture. Amisha Cross and Dr. Sebastian Gorka take on sports teams, Black Lives Matter, and more. You don't want to miss this debate. Next. America, one nation, from Florida to St. Louis to Seattle. America This Week, America's fastest growing political show, delivers facts, not falsehoods. Well, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I appreciate the opportunity to clear some of it up. Hard-edged opinions. We can no longer rely on China to be the primary producer of so many critical products that we need in a time of crisis. Tough topic debates. Has the mainstream media vetted Joe Biden the way they vetted others on the right? I just believe that all women have the right to speak their truth and that those truths should also be investigated. The end, regardless of what political party they are a part of. America This Week reveals the topics and issues that pulse throughout America. Fighting COVID-19. We're working with every single state to be able to detect outbreaks before they spread into the community. And the path forward. Getting back to some degree of normality, that will come. We will get over this. There he is, over here. America This Week investigates chaos at the southern border. Go, 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 go. The poisoning of America. It's in the soils, it's in the water, and it's in our blood. Toxic chemicals linked to multiple cancers found in towns across America. We were poisoned, and we are still poisoned. Almost every day, there is a new community that is finding out that their water is contaminated. America This Week relentlessly seeks the truth on your behalf. I'm Eric Bowling. Join me for a fascinating look at America This Week. From changing the names of sports teams like the Washington Redskins and the Cleveland Indians to tearing down statues of our founding fathers, have we reached a new era of cancel culture? Let's bring in political commentator Amisha Cross and former deputy assistant to President Trump, host of America First on Salem Radio, and Sinclair Media contributor. Thank you, Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Uh, Seb, let's start with you. Um, you, you know, th this, this argument about... The Washington Redskins has been gone a long time. The Cleveland Indians, the uh, Atlanta Braves, the Chicago Blackhawks. Where are you on this? Well, I think we should ask Native Americans. A recent survey was published where nine out of ten have no problem with these names. It's, it's not about being correct. It's not about sensitivity. It's about control, whether it's statues, whether it's sports team names. The fact that they're now attacking Frederick Douglass's statue this tells you everything you need to know about the craziness on America's streets. Listen to the founders of BLM. Eric, we have video. The founders of the Black Lives Matter organization said, we are trained Marxists. Read their website. It's about attacking institutions. It's not about justice and peace. All right, let, let me bring it over to Amisha. Amisha, um, you and I are both from Chicago. Chicago Blackhawks, one of the most beloved sports teams in the city. It, it, you know, when I think of a mascot, Amisha, I think of power. I think of winning. I think of strength. How all of a sudden uh, is a mascot, the Blackhawks, how is that offensive? Is it racially offensive? Is it offensive to you? I, I'm a huge Chicago Blackhawks fan, have been for years, even before they got all the titles they currently have. I, I think that the bigger issue here, though, aside from, you know, sports enthusiasm, is that there is a population that was castigated by America that was seen as a group that didn't even deserve to be in this country. And we have taken their names. We, you know, the United States has taken their names and basically made a mockery of them wait, by wait, placing Amisha, them on Amisha, Why is it a mockery? Making... Why is it a mockery? I mean, I would love the, I don't know, the Washington Bowlings to be the football team here. It would be an honor to be named as a mascot. It's just, it's just strength and power. How is, how is naming a team... Um, after a black cock or a brave or an Indian, how is that a mockery? How, what, what history comes along with that naming? 
that I've never seen anything in the Blackhawks whatsoever that actually um, epitomizes or showcases or even talks about the history of the Blackhawks in this country. And I think that when we do things, when we take names and we use them without really fully showcasing what happened to these individuals throughout the course of American history, there is a problem there. Also, these individual tribes do not benefit whatsoever from these names. So again, I think that it's problematic that these names have just basically been stolen, their history eradicated, and those groups are still suffering to get their basic needs met in America. All right, Seb, have we hit peak, I don't know, peak crazy in, in America where, uh, you know, now names uh, that, that would normally show power and winning and, you know, aspirational things are now somehow, I don't know, racist. I, it, it just blows my mind. You know, the, the, the statues. Statues coming down. I'll tell you, we do this thing. I do this thing called We Hear You, and it's call in uh, every show. I would tell you, we got well over 300 calls, and I'd say two thirds of them were really ticked off about statues coming down. I think we need to unpack this a little bit more. Sure, there were some that may be offensive, and I get it. Maybe they just need to be removed or moved to another place. Are you okay with at least that? Look, uh, you can have a conversation about this but at the end of the day you have to remember one thing Eric this is a mob you never ever surrender you never genuflect to the mob because it's the thin end of the wedge President Trump told us what was it nine months ago Eric sooner or later they're going to come after George Washington well they skipped George Washington and they went after the freed slave Frederick Douglass this is insanity it's about control Control. It's about making sure that you have to do what they say. And if you disagree with them, you will be canceled. This is cultural Marxism. No more, no less. And, and Amisha, let's talk a little bit about the news this week where there was a white couple that painted over the Black Lives Matter uh, logo in the street. Now, as of this taping, they were being sought after for a hate crime. I'm just, I, listen, I, I, I get don't deface things and have permits for doing things that you want to do. But do you think that was a hate crime? No, um, I think that that is a bit of a stretch, especially in this case. Was I upset that they painted over it? Yes. But to define something as a hate crime that actually does not involve any type of real violence is somewhat problematic. And, and, and let's take it one step further. Um, you know, there, there, there are those who are going to say, look, all they, they did the same thing that a lot of the, you know, the Antifa crowd has been doing. Maybe some of the Black Lives Matter crowd has been doing where they're, where they're spray painting. They're, they're, um, they're voicing their First Amendment right using this in this case paint it's is it any different from what we've seen in seattle or minnesota or new york or or, or dc absolutely think that it is because in this case we know that this was this was a direct pushback from people who don't believe in black lives matter not only as an institution but also as a means to moving the country forward they could have easily just stood by and done nothing the city put that there this isn't an individual who just decided to paint black lives matter on streets the city put it there to showcase the fact that they care about a population that feels as though for decades they have been subjugated by American culture and American society. To push against that in the way that they have mm -hmm. says something, and it yeah. says that we do not care. Well, what about that, Sebastian? If the city did put Black Lives Matter on the streets as, as a show of support to the, to the group, and then the couple comes in and defaces that, is that not the same thing that the, a lot of people on the right have been complaining about the original graffiti going on on buildings, sides of buildings, etc. Oh, gra graffiti is wrong, whoever's doing it. But the idea that, you no, know, Amisha just said Black Lives Matter is moving the issue forward. No, it's actually moving us back. They're not doing anything to make things better for black Americans. 20, more than 20 people, Eric, have been killed in the riots since George Floyd was killed. Uh, we had a half of those were black Americans. Mm -hmm. If they cared mm -hmm. about Black Lives Matter, they would be on the streets of Chicago every Sunday where right. over a hundred people were shot and over a dozen were killed yeah. just last weekend. They yeah. don't care about black lives. It's about power and it always has been. Oh, we're going to leave it right there. Sebastian Gorka and Misha Cross, always great debates with you two. Thank you. Ahead on America This Week, I'm talking one-on-one -on -one with Congressman Brian Babbitt. Last week, you were very animated. The toll-free number lit up all weekend long. We received several hundred calls. Overwhelmingly, many of you were really upset about the statues coming down. Now, I listen to each and every call, and the call is 100% toll-free, 888-601-0032. Now, this week, I wanted you to hear some comments from all sides. Here are just a few. And I'm sick of these people 
these representatives that would not stop these people from breaking down the statue. And I'm a foreigner. I love America, and it's getting on my nerves that these people are not saying one word. These Democrats not saying one word. And sadly, for 50 odd years, I followed the Democratic Party. Yeah, here's a piece of my mind. When it comes to defacing statues, shootings and riots and protests in 2020, all this is a hundred years set back because history will repeat itself. I'd like to order a large pepperoni pizza. Thank you. That's fine, but pepperoni, extra cheese, that's extra too. Here's that number again, 888-601-0032. As you can see, you really can say anything. You can also go to ericbowling.com or follow me on Twitter at Eric Bowling. I'll keep making sure they hear you too. United we stand, we never fall. This perilous fight, it takes one and all. Everyone stands, American strong. Strength by one equals strength by all. serve it takes everyone with steady nerves everyone stands american strong strength by one equal strength by all american values american pride your neighbor needs you each person each time we stand america united strong. we stand we stand america strong city by city state by state town by I'd like to welcome Texas Congressman Brian Babman to the show. Congressman, thank you for being here. What is the great state of Texas? You're watching these statues come down, the rewriting of history. What do the good people of Texas have to say about that? The good people of Texas are very, very upset about seeing the continuation of lawlessness in our country. They're ready to stop it. Uh, we're getting a lot of constituent calls and, and communications that just they're very disturbed about what's happening. And uh, we, we, the, the, the anarchy we're seeing, the Democratic Party in the areas of, of cities and blue states uh, and, uh, and blue counties, uh, people are very upset that they're not, they're, not, they're not enforcing the law. And then on top of that, they're abolishing and defunding police departments. Incredible, incredible. Sir, there are a couple of topics that are that are bubbling up. Obviously, the coronavirus is, is big and it's important to the state of Texas. And we're watching this this whole racial tension going on. What is, what is the what do you think that the 2020 Donald Trump reelection or the, the presidential election? What's the topic du jour? What's the most important topic? Oh, I think it's going to be coming out of this covid. I think it's going to be coming uh, uh, getting our, our economy stood back up. Uh, the CARES Act, which uh, we passed, and you know, even as a conservative Republican, I voted for a two trillion dollar bill uh, because this was through no fault of any American citizen. This was something that was a gift of the Communist Party of China uh, and the and the uh, uh, the World Health Organization. And uh, so here we have uh, we've gone from the best economy we've had in in, in 60 years uh, to the one of the worst in the history of our country. And uh, the Democrats just can't stand it, Eric. When we get start, we, we keep getting uh, the last two months, we've gotten a, 
a huge boost in job creation. And uh, I think people are willing or wanting to go back to work. Americans are workers. Uh, they, they're tired of the, of the violence. They're tired of the lockdowns. They want to go back to work. Uh, they want to be productive. And uh, we, they, they're, they're, again, they're upset when they see Democrats uh, continue to push for, for lockdowns or uh, continue to encourage anarchy. Uh, and uh, I, I think that, that the Democrats are willing uh, to see the economy continue to uh, to be stagnant and even worsen in order to get an upper get an upper hand on, on Donald Trump's and the Republicans' re-election chances. Thomas, Sad if, to say, but if if that's true, and, and and I don't disagree with you, I'm just wondering if that's true. If the Democrats have said, you know, let's let's stay locked down, let's make sure everyone's wearing masks, let's not reopen the economy, because some would say that that would that would benefit Joe Biden in in the upcoming election, wouldn't adding more stimulus and more checks in people's hands allow people to not go back to work? Are, are, are you guys, is Congress playing right into the Democrats' hands? I don't think so, because I can tell you that me and many of my colleagues are very concerned. We, we haven't even allocated much of the funding that we've already voted for and passed the president signed into law. I do not see a need for, except in maybe some very, very targeted areas, like another PPP extension or something to help stand up small businesses, because we are having uh, some resurgent cases in uh, several states. But I, I, I don't think that I could ever vote for another stimulus package like that. Uh, and there was a lot of waste in that. And we also saw exactly the strategy of the Democrats uh, who tried to load it down with a bunch of unrelated to COVID uh, issues and and just try to lard it up with billions of dollars and trillions of dollars extra uh, when uh, we knew that we, we should have specific targets and this is what the CARES Act was primarily meant to do. All right, Again, there were some... There were some Congressman, we got to leave it there. We came up against a heartbreak. Apologize, but thank you for your time. Co Congressman Brian Babin from the great state of Texas. Thank you. Every week we honor first responders who died in the line of duty protecting our great country. On Independence Day, 26-year-old Officer Anthony Dia with the Toledo, Ohio Police Department was shot and killed. Officer Dia joined the department in July 2018. He leaves behind his wife, two sons, and parents. Last week, Sergeant Craig Johnson with the Tulsa, Oklahoma Police Department died after he was shot multiple times during a traffic stop. Sergeant Johnson served the department for 15 years. He's survived by his wife and two sons and parents. Rest in peace, officers. America, one nation, from Florida to St. Louis to Seattle. America This Week. America's fastest growing political show delivers facts, not falsehoods. Well, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I appreciate the opportunity to clear some of it up. Hard edged opinions. We can no longer rely on China to be the primary producer of so many critical products that we need in a time of crisis. Tough topic debates. Has the mainstream media vetted? Joe Biden the way they vetted others on the right. I just believe that all women have the right to speak their truth and that those truths should also be investigated. The end, regardless of what political party they are a part of. America This Week reveals the topics and issues that pulse throughout America. Fighting COVID-19. We're working with every single state to be able to detect outbreaks before they spread into the community. And the path forward. Getting back to some degree of normality, that will come. We will get over this. America This Week investigates chaos at the southern border. Go, 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 go. The poisoning of America. It's in the soils. It's in the water. And it's in our blood. Toxic chemicals linked to multiple cancers found in towns across America. We were poisoned. And we are still poisoned. Almost every day. There is a new community that is finding out that their water is contaminated. America This Week relentlessly seeks the truth on your behalf. I'm Eric Bowling. Join me for a fascinating look at America This Week.
Nick Adams is the founder and president of the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, and he recently released a new book called Trump and Churchill, Defenders of Western Civilization. Nick, thank you for being here. Before I get to the book, you know, uh, President Trump recently went to Mount Rushmore. A lot of people, I personally think it was one of his best speeches ever. A lot of people thought it was something completely different. Let's take a little bite of what he had to say. Our nation is witnessing a merciless campaign to wipe out our history, to fame our heroes, erase our values, and indoctrinate our children. So, Nick, go ahead. Tell us a little bit about, now, in your book, you, you compare President Trump to Winston Churchill. I've heard him compared to Margaret Thatcher. Tell us what the comparisons are and why you see him. Oh, Eric, look, I think Donald Trump is very much a Winston Churchill-like figure. Both men refuse to conform to expectations. Both are alpha males. Both are clear thinkers. Both endured acrimonious relationships with the media. Both endured battles with the political establishment. There are lots of parallels between the times and the men. And if you ever wanted to see a Churchillian-like speech, well, we saw it right there on Mount Rushmore, Eric. I happen to think it was the best speech the president has given to date. And I think he's given a few incredible ones particularly in Poland and elsewhere. But this one uh, on the 3rd of July, just before the fireworks, was truly remarkable. He was a president laying out his love for America and the fact that there are people that don't love America and are trying to destroy it and everything we've got to do to make sure that we protect it. Let's talk a little bit about that acrimonious relationship with the media. And you point out Winston Churchill had the same. I think a lot of, a lot of world leaders, a lot of, uh, I guess we could call them leaders, heroes, uh, have had the similar situation. Have you, have you ever seen anything quite like this, though? Well, look, absolutely not. I mean, of course, we live in a different time now, 24-hour news cycle. Uh, things are more vicious than ever before. I think the politics has shifted enormously. Uh, Winston Churchill had a lot of flack from the media, Eric. And in fact, there are lots of passages that I've reproduced in my book, Trump and Churchill, uh, that if you didn't know that they were about Winston Churchill and that they were in British national newspapers in the late 1930s, early 1940s, you would think that uh, it was actually about Donald Trump in the New York Times or Washington Post. So identical, so similar are the criticisms uh, that are leveled against him. Uh, but look, Donald Trump is, is, is up against it. He's got a media that is consorting and conspiring to get him out of office. I think he's the best thing that's happened to America in a very long time, Eric. He's the right man for the job. And I am so thankful as an American, as a legal immigrant to this country, that we've got a president that's keeping America, America, and he's pushing back against all of these people that want to turn it into something that it's never been, something that it isn't, and quite frankly, something that it should never be. Nick, give us a, an example of, of some of, you t talked about a couple of comments that were written about Winston Churchill that you could almost uh, think that there's the, the current day speaking about President Trump. Well, he was, he was uh, mocked Eric for being too optimistic. Well, we've heard that before. You know, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio came out and said that uh, Donald Trump was peddling false optimism. Uh, Wolf Blitzer, the same thing in CNN. Uh, Winston Churchill was often told to be overconfident, that he was too confident, uh, too positive. Winston Churchill also, the accusation was levelled against him that he didn't listen to anybody around him but he only followed his gut instinct. Again, something that has been thrown against uh, President Trump as well. So lots of similarities because the men had similar personalities. They were leaders, they were unafraid, unapologetic, direct, combative, and they were prepared to do what they thought was right. They listened to the council around them, but they didn't necessarily always take that council, instead relying on their native instincts. And it's those very native instincts, Eric, that have given us the greatness of the last three and a half years. And I think if given another chance, we'll go on for another four years to make this country even better than it's ever been. 
All right, we're gonna, Nick, we're going to leave it there. And again, I think President Trump likes the comparison because I've seen a few retweets of your book and recommending your book. Again, it's called Trump and Churchill Defenders of Western Civilization. Nick Adams, thank you very much for your time. Never miss an episode of America This Week. Just set your DVR to find out when we air in your city. Go to Facebook.com slash America Bowling. That's all one word. We have a complete list of cities at the top of that page. We stand, we never fall. This perilous fight, it takes one at all. Everyone stands, American strong. Strength by one equals strength by all. American values, American pride. Your neighbor needs you, each person, each time. serve it takes everyone with steady nerves everyone stands american strong strength by one equal strength by all american values american pride your neighbor needs you each person each time Thanks for joining me for another fantastic episode of America This Week. Summer is in full swing. Be sure to make time to have a little fun. It can happen even in the middle of a pandemic. Check out this video from the Rockland, California Police Department. It appears an officer took making community connections to a whole new level. Have a great night, everybody. Everybody get to. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, Troy always holds them on for the end. <laughs>